Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you all are taking good care during this pandemic and not just taking care of yourself, but also everyone around you by actually distancing yourself from others and being careful. Uh, in this lecture today, I'll build on my part one of my lecture on Terry Eagleton's chapter four on post-structuralism. And I hope to conclude the discussion of post-structuralism in this lecture. Now, Eagleton spends a lot of time in this part of the chapter, the second part of the chapter. He dwells for quite a few pages on Roland Barthes' work. And one of the reasons that he himself explains is because in Barthes' work, you can see the transition in one scholar and critic's work from being a staunch structuralist to eventually becoming a post-structuralist. And that is what he traces through a discussion of Barthes' work. But what we learn in the process also is you know, what is involved other than Derrida, who's uh, part in the post-structuralist movement I already talked about in the first lecture. But how does it happen in Barthes? What are the material causes for it? What are the ideological or philosophical reasons behind that? And that transition Eagleton explains it on page 116. He says, we have moved, in other words, from the era of structuralism to the reign of post-structuralism, a style of thought which embraces the deconstructive operations of Derrida, which I've already talked about, and you can look up that video and watch it. The work of the French historian, Michel Foucault, right? Foucault is really important, especially the late Foucault and the writings of the French psychoanalyst Lacan and of the feminist philosopher and critic Julia Kristeva. I have not discussed Foucault's work explicitly in this book. That's what Eagleton is saying. But what he suggests is that this chapter would have not been possible without a knowledge of Foucault. And I'll bring it up in my discussion. And then he goes on to explaining Barth's significance to post-structuralism, right? So what Foucault is saying is that the early Barth was a staunch structuralist, right? We talked about him in my first lecture, right? But towards, as his career develops, right, his chick playful neologistic prose style signifies a kind of excess of writing over the rigors of structuralist inquiry, right? And it is an area of freedom with, where he can sport, play, you mean, partially released from the tyranny of the meaning. And this is the Barth who has fun with his writing. He's no longer doing some kind of a technical analysis of a structure of a poem as we read his later works beyond mythologies and beyond his early work on structuralism. We find out that Barth is increasingly writing in a more creative fashion, in a way that his writing about other people's writing itself becomes a work of art, is creative and is open-ended, right? And that's the part that, uh, that Eagleton is emphasizing here, okay? So Barth describes what he means by a healthy sign, and this is discussed by Eagleton on page 117. So as we know, right, what was structuralism? A structuralism, according to Eagleton, was a move into language, right? The material causes, and I will have a slide for it later, were, were obviously that the world in which these people and writers existed was no longer the world they thought it ought to be. You know, industrialism had happened, people, the reality was fragmented. That's why modernism happens, right? And the critics then move into the text, into the structure, because that's a safe place. That's where they can be brilliant. They can write about things which does not have to worry about what's happening in the world. And for Barth, then, a healthy sign, right, uh, 
language is Barth's theme from beginning to end. That is Eagleton about Barth's work. And in particular, the Saussurian insight that the sign is always a matter of historical and cultural convention. We talked about it, how the sign is decided by the convention. The healthy sign for Barth is one which draws attention to its own arbitrariness, which does not try to palm itself off as natural but which in the very moment of conveying a meaning communicates something of its own relative artificial status as well. So what is at stake in understanding what is a healthy sign, right? The only time a sign is terroristic in Barth's uh, vocabulary or not healthy, let's say, is when it is offering your itself to you as complete, as natural, right? And what is at stake in that understanding is because if we believe that science can represent the real, a definite real, a plausible real, then people can build huge mythologies around it. Think of the binary structure of the sign, man, woman, now, if we read the binary as it represents itself as stable, then there are certain attributes associated with, with man. If we buy them as natural, then that hierarchy is already established. And that is an unhealthy sign because it palms itself as natural and then accepts for us to give it our allegiance, right? Because we think that it represents the real, right? Uh, for the, the nation, right? Nationalism. If a nation state offers itself as natural, as not, not a sign that has been constructed, that is ideologically produced, if we buy into those imperatives, then we can have what you could call an organistic view of nation. Nation as an organism, right? And build huge vocabularies of destruction on that. That is what he means by an unhealthy or terroristic sign. And what is a sign that offers itself as unstable, as not complete, maybe infused with other signs? Where does it, what kind of a writing, writing we need for that, right? And that's where we enter this debate between realism and modernism. Now, what, what were realism's claim? You know, m more importantly, the American realists uh, claimed that, yeah, there should be some imagination, but by and large, an author should represent reality as it is. Now, is it possible to do so? Probably not. But if we are reading a realistic work, it is filled with unhealthy signs because it is offering itself as a representation of reality. Compared to that, a modernist text, ideally speaking, offers itself as deeply crafted. No modernist author would tell you this was just me sitting down and jotting down whatever came to my mind. A modernist text announces itself as deeply crafted, right? It asks for an erudite, knowing reader. Right? So that means that the text as a symbol already is pointing to its own artificiality, its own createdness, right? And that is at stake. That's why modernism is the period which ideally works better for post-structuralism. But then going back to the problem with the unhealthy signs, signs that offer themselves as natural, right? Uh, on page 117, Eagleton says, signs which pass themselves off as natural, which offer themselves as the only conceivable way of viewing the world, are by that token authoritarian and ideological. It is one of the functions of ideology to naturalize social reality, to make it seem as innocent and unchangeable as nature itself, right? Any time a sign system offers itself as such, think of it this way, all religious metaphysics, right? 
all claims, religious claims, offer themselves as natural signs. And when we buy into them, the social and cultural hierarchies that they put in place are the ones we live our lives through, right? Even though the interpretations, the representations is ideal, ideological, but no sacred text tells you I am an ideological text. It says I am the truth. And that you know, I had that point there, realism versus modernism I talked about. So realism in literature offered itself as a representation of the real, right? We were supposed to believe that this is reality being passed down to us. Whereas in modernism, as we enter a modernist text, we already know it's a deeply crafted text and it's indeterminate, right? So in a way, then, Eagleton would eventually claim that post-structuralism would not be possible without modernism, because what the post-structuralists do, what Barth is doing in his work is actually a form of modernism, not offering conclusive understandings of things, not offering, you know, a monolithic understanding of things, right? Having a lot of ambivalence, but in the process of criticism, creating an open-ended work. Right. So the realist or representational sign then is for Barthes essentially unhealthy. It effaces its own status as a sign in order to foster the illusion that we were we are perceiving reality without its intervention. So I already talked about it. Right. Whenever something offer its, offers itself as natural. Right. If it exists in language, it has been constructed. We already know that. But so many times there are certain terminologies, certain thought systems, certain ways of living that offer themselves as natural, right? Being a woman, being a man, gender, all these. And when that happens, that for birth is an unhealthy sign, right? So based on that then, Barth also then talks about what kind of texts are there. So there is a readable text, a text that you read and it offers itself as the truth. But then Barth suggests that there are also texts that are writable, right? In one of his works, uh, in Balzac's story, uh, the literary work, Eagleton says, is now no longer treated as a stable object or delimited structure. Now, that would have been the case in structuralism, right? And the language of the critic has disowned all pretensions to scientific objectivity. The most intriguing texts for criticism are not those which can be read, but those which are writable, scriptable, right? Texts which encourage the critic to carve them up transpose them into different discourses, produce his or her semi-arbitrary play of meaning the work against the work itself. The reader or critic shifts from the role of consumer to that of producer. And that is one attribute of post-structuralism, especially with Barth. And that is that you read a text but in the process of reading and writing about it, right, what you create is not necessarily a controlled meaning of the text, but another creative work that plays with the text, that lays it open, sometimes points out something that might have been missed. Uh, another great example of that outside of Barth, of course, is Derrida's reading of Phaedrus, right? I mentioned it in my previous lecture. That is Derrida reading one of Plato's dialogues as a writable text, because in the process of reading it, he says, here, if you read it like this, this is where I can take that text. So that's probably what Barth also means by the writable text. What are some of the qualities of the writable text? The writable text, usually a modernist one, has no determinate meaning, no settled signifies but is plural and diffuse, an inexhaustible tissue or galaxy of signifiers, a seamless weave of codes and fragments of codes through which the critic may cut his own errant path. 
there are no beginnings and no ends, no sequences which cannot be reversed, no hierarchy of textual levels to tell you what is more or less significant. I mean, think of a classic modernist text, think of Ulysses, right? Joyce's Ulysses. When you read it, it doesn't give you a single meaning. It doesn't even tell you what it's doing. You write about the text. Your experience of reading the text writes what's happening in a text. Similarly, any of the works of Beckett, right? Um, you know, any of other stream of conscious authors, all of these texts are not giving us a delimited story or controlled signifiers, right? These are all writable text, but what Eagleton is also establishing here is this connection between post-structuralism and modernism. Then Barth also suggests in one of his work, right, that's where when he's trying to define that we should no longer deal with works, we are dealing with text, that movement from the text work to text, and he says all literary texts are woven out of other literary texts. Not in the conventional sense that they bear the traces of influence, but in the more radical sense that every word, phrase, or segment is a reworking of other writings which precede or surround the individual work. And that idea about intertextuality, intertextuality in the same temporality with other texts beside the text, but also historical, diachronic intertextuality, that destroys this idea of a defined, delimited work and opens it up to as a text right within an array of all the other texts which could have been openly, could have influenced it, which could have, you know, uh, maybe unconsciously influenced it. The psyche of the author comes into play too, but mostly that a writable text is intertextual and it does not palm itself as natural or realistic and it does not give us neat solutions and post-structuralist way of writing about text also then is a play with the text. It's playful, it's writing about the text but not necessarily telling us here is the crux of that meaning. I mean think of it that way. I was trained in Pakistan in my early education and the way we were trained to read literature was we were supposed to produce in our exam and test as to what a story meant. That means that when our teacher taught us, they gave us solutions. This is what this story means. And we internalize that logic. Even now I get questions from people, you know, can you tell us how post 9-11 identities work, right? How can we apply post-colonial theory to it? We don't need a specific work that deals with it. We can pick up any theoretical concept and apply it to it. Similarly, any novel or book that we read, we don't need to look for one meaning, right? But that's what I was trained to do. And I had to break that habit and, and make my reading of text more you know, indeterminate, more open. And that's what he's talking about here. Um, you know, about a writable text. And the movement from the work to text, Eagleton talks about it on page 120, says the movement from structuralism to post-structuralism is in part, as Barth himself has phrased it, a movement from work to text. It is a shift from seeing the poem or novel as the closed entity equipped with definite meaning, which it is, which it is the critic's task to decipher to seeing it as irreducibly plural, an endless play of signifiers which can never be finally nailed down to a single center essence or meaning. Now what does that remind you of? If you remember my first lecture, this endless play of signifiers, Derrida talks about that in the language, right? Now we are applying it to a text, right? that just as in language, when we, we look at one sign, that sign is arrayed within an endless chain of signification. Similarly, a text, when read by a post-structuralist critic, is also open-ended, right? And we can write about it in different ways, right? And we don't have to try to see 
what is its core meaning and what is it's trying to say now barth develops in one of his works right um, a, a method which might seem like structuralism but it is not right so he reads in one of his works a text by developing certain lexes or small units so by dividing a text into small units and then he says here are five codes that i'm going to use to read this text so the first one is uh, prioritic or narrative code and that's a mm, code a hermeneutic code concerned with the tales unfolding enigmas, a cultural code which examines the stock of social knowledge on which the work draws, a semic code dealing with the connotations of persons, places, and objects, and a symbolic code charting the sexual and psychological relations set up in the text. And this is on page 120. But Eagleton does give us a clarification here. He says, you know, now the division of the text into units is more or less arbitrary, right? And the five codes are simply five selected from an indefinite possible number. They are ranked in no sort of hierarchy, but applied sometimes three to the same lexi in a pluralistic way. And they refrain from finally totalizing the work into any kind of coherent sense, right? And that's where it becomes post-structuralism. Had these codes been given to us as these five possible codes, I mean, think of it like uh, what in my lecture on structuralism was, like Jacobson's six elements of communication, all they have a certain hierarchy, they all needed to be applied. But here, what he's saying is, even though Barth is developing these five codes, he is not also creating a hierarchy and these are not the only five codes that he's applying so there is plurality there is a degree of freedom involved in applying these codes to the chosen text and for both then the text the text Barth argues is less a structure than an open-ended process of structuration and it is a criticism which does this structuring Okay, so previously we believed that the text holds all the meanings and we need to figure out how it is structured and plotted against a structure. What Barth is saying as a post-structuralist is that the, that the text is not necessarily a structure but a process of structuration and that structuration is the role of the critic, right? the critic comes in and lends a, gives a structure to the text. And that structure is, how am I going to read this text, right, as a critic. And that act then takes away the primacy of the structure which we were going to implot on our text and gives the critic the creative possibility of creating new meanings, of finding new ways of interacting with the text and reading it. So furthermore, on page 121, it is in fact the literary movement of modernism. And now here Eagleton is explaining what prompted post-structuralism. Modernism, which brought structuralist and post-structuralist criticism to birth in the first place. Some of the later works of Barth and Derrida are modernist literary texts in themselves because they are indeterminate. They don't take one position. They are polyvocal if you read them but they are richly ambiguous, he says. There is no clear division of post-structuralism between criticism and creation. Both modes are subsumed into writing as such. So if you've read your Derrida, and if you read later Barth, you will know that the way they write about text in itself is creative. And it's very modern because it doesn't take just one or other stance. It leaves all the possibilities open, right? Now, then Eagleton, for some reason, on page 121, goes on to explain, you know, how did structuralism come to be, right? And he gives us certain material causes for it. And part of it was the rise of the 20th century industrial economy, the rise of bureaucracy, the, the taken over of the public spaces by, you know, 
media and others and the, just as modernism was then escaped from that fractured reality to the integrity of the text itself, the structuralist also, because of these anxieties, move into the text, into the structure, and that move into the language is, Eagleton sees it as a move to seek some security within something that can be, you know, uh, totally away from the world in which these people existed, right? And and here were some of the questions that these people asked. Europe was felt to be in the throes of deep crisis. How was one to write in an industrial society where discourse had become degraded to a mere instrument of science and positivism, right? What audience was one to write for in any case, given the saturation of the reading public by a mass profit hungry anodyne culture. These were some of the questions that drove the modernists to writing the way they wrote, right? And these were the questions Eagleton says, the historic, these were the historical conditions of modern writing, which foregrounded the problem of language so dramatically. I mean, think of it, the wasteland, Ulysses, pretty much a lot of all the works of Hemingway, Faulkner, Virginia Woolf. What is the most, Kafka, the earliest of all, what is the most significant aspect of their writing? You know, what they do with language, right? How do they make language so flexible, but also so indeterminate, right? The question, as someone would say, some scholars, of course, do say, in modernism then becomes who is saying what and can I trust it, right? The questions are epistemological, right? We don't ask that question in realism, right? We just read a novel, Maggie, the Girl of the Streets, and we are saying this is going to be the story of Maggie, the Girl, girl of the Streets. When we pick up Ulysses, I have no idea what it's about. It doesn't announce itself as such. So that emphasis. So then structuralism to post-structuralism on page 122, then Eagleton gives us his explanation of it. Structuralism is best seen as both a symptom of and a reaction to the social and linguistic crisis I have outlined and I talked about it. It flees from history to language. For bars of the pleasures of the text, a book that Barth publishes in 1970. All theory, ideal, ideology, determinate meaning, social commitment have become, it appears, inherently terroristic. And writing is the answer to them all. Writing or reading as writing is the last uncolonized enclave in which the intellectual can play, savoring the sumptuousness of the signifier in heady disregard of whatever might be going on in the Elysee Palace or the Renault factories. In writing, the tyranny of structural meaning could be momentarily ruptured and disclosed by the free play of language, right? So for Barth then, this world over-determined by larger systems, right, against which the largest rebellion of students and everyone has already failed in 1968, right? If you think of the Struton uprising in solidarity with workers, how it is brutally put down. At the same time, the other alternative of Stalinism is being dismantled. We have suddenly learned that this was not the utopia that we Marxists had thought about, that Stalin had literally killed millions of people, right? So all these larger movements have failed. So a response, of course, intellectual response to that is there is nothing reliable, anything that offers itself as a larger system becomes suspect, an all-encompassing system becomes suspect. I mean, think of all the intellectuals who leave the French Communist Party and go and do their things, you know, even Althusser, I think, leaves it, but Foucault and others. And then what they start focusing on is what Deleuze would call the micro resistances, right? Because the larger, the grand narrative of change is no longer possible, has failed, right? 
post-structuralism is then that this emphasis on the smaller aspects of the narratives, the petite narratives, right? So people like Derrida working on disrupting the binary oppositions, people like Barth and others moving on to studying texts, Foucault especially, Foucault, the later Foucault talking about that we are now in an age where experts have the opinions about, have the knowledge and they need to work, Foucault and Deleuze, they need to work in solidarity with uh, workers, with the prison, prisoners. The fights can be anywhere, right? As long as there is a fight against power. Foucault's theory of power that is diffuse, all of that is a production of this movement into language. And then beyond that, this opposition to larger structures determining and even larger utopias. So historical background to post-structuralism was a post-structuralism was a product of that blend of euphoria and disillusionment from 1968. The student movement fails. All such systemic thought was now suspect as terroristic. Conceptual meaning itself as opposed to libidinal gestures and anarchist spontaneity was feared as repressive reading for the later Bath is not cognition, but erotic play. The only forms of political action now felt to be acceptable were of a local, diffuse and strategic kind, right? And that's significant. Um, this emphasis on local, of course, it comes from Deleuze as well as on Foucault. And that gives us the idea of power, right? There, it's not architectural. According to Foucault, then power is diffuse, right? The resistance coming from Deleuze becomes rhizomatic, right? And the idea is that I fight over here, you fight over here. We can have different politics. We can have different solidarities, right? But the possibility of having a large monolithic movement against capital or anything else is not possible, right? Then after the disc discussion of Barth, um, Eagleton goes to towards a critique of American, Anglo-American use of deconstruction. What basically primarily he's saying the Yale School and others he's saying is that these people are actually doing the kind of deconstruction that Derrida himself would have not understood or approved. For Derrida, when he does deconstruction, the, you know, what he accomplishes is disrupting the binaries and destroying the truth claims of a text, right? Or the binary structure of a larger discourse. What these critics, according to Eagleton, focus on is the concept of undecidability of the sign itself, which is a Deridian insight, right? Because the sign itself is undecided and we need to figure out what decides it, right? And then what they have done with Derrida is they have completely depoliticized it. Of course, Derrida is never openly political other than his book on Marx, right? But what they have made the work of the critic is this, this circular erasure of, I am going to find this thing in the text and make it undecidable until someone else comes along and reads my text and makes it undecidable and exercise in undecidability. That is what Eagleton talks about, which has no political function, right? And he names a few critics. You can read them in the chapter, but that's his critique of American deconstruction as it is practiced in the American Acad Academy. He also, towards the end of the chapter, moves into feminism. Now, if it's 70s, right? So he's talking about probably the rise, the, the end of the second wave feminism and the beginning of the first wave feminism, and especially Kristeva's work, right? And that how is it that the feminists themselves are rereading the structural texts of the binary structures, right? And then using that knowledge to disrupt that. Now, throughout the chapter also, he also points out the academic nature of post-structuralist movement and their claims, because when post-structuralists are escaping from reality and reading texts more brilliantly, 
things are happening in the world. You know, most of the developing nations that we call right now are fighting their fights for freedom. Some of them are mobilizing Marxist ideologies. So what these Western intellectuals have kind of abandoned is still mobilizing people enough to come together and to win their freedoms. That is already happening. So in so many ways, our understanding of modernity and structuralism and post-structuralism is very Eurocentric. And thankfully, Eagleton points to that, right? Just as we are talking about the failure of 1968, you know, there are people in Vietnam fighting an empire, right? And eventually defeating it, right? Some of them happen to be Marxist, right? So overall, then, by the time we finish this chapter, the first part of the chapter was about he, Eagleton explaining Derrida's work, which you can, of course, uh, watch in my first lecture on this topic. And then he spends a lot of time on Barth. And the reason I explained he spends a lot of time on Barth is because you can track the transition, Barth's own transition from a structuralist to a post-structuralist. And then towards the end of the novel, there is a critique of deconstruction as practiced in the American Academy and a general critique of this mindset, which tells us nothing can be political anymore and that we all we can do is just read the text more brilliantly. Of course, being a Marxist, Eagleton is opposed to that view. And then towards the end of the chapter, he talks about briefly about the feminist movement, second wave and third wave, and their attempts at destroying the binary structure of the, the patriarchy. And then he tells us, now we will see how consciousness works in material conditions and that's why the next chapter is psychoanalysis. So I hope this was useful to you. Uh, there is no way for me to cover every chapter in great detail. So of course, if you have any questions, please send them my way and I'll try to answer them. And if you would like me to add something more to this body of work, I'll be happy to do that. Meanwhile, please stay healthy, take care of yourself, um, do that social distancing, right? But help each other, be kind and generous. With that, thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.